it was about nine months ago, Michael and I and a few other people sat down and said, wouldn't it be great to get activists and journalists together from around the world and talk about these issues that Michael has just set out so eloquently? Uh, wouldn't it be great to host that in the Global South, maybe in South Africa? Who, who would organize such a complicated uh, initiative at such short notice in such a fast moving environment and everyone else stepped backwards and Michael was left uh, stepping forwards but he's done an incredible job and I think we should just uh, pay him uh, thanks for getting us all here really uh, really you know with, with support from Gibbs I know but effectively single handedly it's really really impressive so look we are going to talk now about Australia so we're all talking about over the next two days about this complicated difficult relationship between platforms which as Michael says dominate and control the world's discourse and publishers news publishers who inject one vital component into that discourse trustworthy accurate relevant topical information in the public interest we need this relationship to work if our societies and democracies are to survive if this relationship does not work we are all in real trouble so one part of the solution to this complicated problem takes the form of a bargaining code a regulatory code that re requires platforms and publishers to come to the table in good faith and negotiate over the fair exchange of data and revenues. And that model, which a few years ago might have seemed like a pretty obscure thought experiment, something that some policy wonks might propose in a, in a report or in a think tank paper, that's now real because one country, one quite small country in, in population terms, came forward and said, okay, let's do it. Um, let's do this at home in Michael's terms. And that country was Australia. And I'm really pleased to be joined by Emma McDonald, Nelson Yap, and Lawrence Gibbons to talk really about the Australian experience. So I think so th to help the rest of us think about what this means in our countries, I think we need to get into the detail of what happened in Australia. What is the Australian news media bargaining code? There are a lot of myths out there and diff different and conflicting reports really on what is this thing? What does it do? Is it a link tax? Is it going to break the internet? Conversely, is it something which simply allows for deals between Mark Zuckerberg and Rupert Murdoch and which excludes the rest of the, the information economy? Or is it, as some of its advocates would say, it's the best in the best of all possible worlds. It's a wonderful solution to this complex problem. Let's find out. Emma McDonald is a director at the Mindaroo Foundation, Australia's largest private foundation, and was former senior policy advisor to the Federal Minister for um, Communications and was part of the team that actually helped to develop the code. And we're going to talk about Emma's experience of seeing the code from both sides, because since leaving the government, she has been working with Lawrence and, and Nelson and others to make sure that small publishers can benefit from these provisions. Lawrence Gibbons is publisher of the Star Observer and the Sydney City Hub and the co-founder with Nelson of the Public Interest Publishers Alliance, which we'll talk about in more detail. Nelson Yap is also the publisher of the Australian Property Journal. So we have a fantastic panel to really get into the detail, the story behind all these, these, these claims and counterclaims. Emma, let's begin. So... To early 2021, suddenly the world has its first bargaining code, the Australian News Media Bargaining Code. But it didn't appear from nowhere. There were several years of, of, of policy making and arguments. And tell us a, a bit about a bit about that. Where 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 did this idea come from, and how did it develop? It's very hard to know where it exactly came from because, as everyone knows, success has many parents. So there's a lot of people who take credit for the um, coming up with the idea of the bargaining code. Um, but it was first floated in about, I think, 2017, 2018 as an idea um, to the then treasurer um, by various people who um, the treasurer of Australia then directed the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission to undertake a review of um, a, a whole range of things related to um, uh, the digital platforms. And there were several reports, the interim reports, and then a final report that landed in 
2019 with the government, which had 23 recommendations, one of which was the establishment of a news media bargaining code. Um, and then from 2019, there was further consultation between stakeholders and government and the ACCC, and obviously the, the platforms were heavily involved. And eventually, by the end of 2020, legislation was introduced into the Australian Parliament. Um, a Senate committee took place, very similar. If anyone's been following what's happening in Canada, it's a very similar process. Um, a Senate hearing, um, inquiry, etc., and then finally in late February 2021, it became law in Australia. So, so let's just very briefly then try and set out the key elements of that law. What does it actually say? It says a lot, but one of the key things in it is that it, as it stands currently, um, many of the um, the sections of the code are not active, so to speak. Um, and the reason for that is the government set it up in a way to try and encourage uh, news media businesses and the platforms to be able to reach commercial deals um, without the need for what is sometimes referred to, and you may have heard this expression, designation. And so several elements in the code come into operation if a platform is designated under the code. But notwithstanding that the fact that that piece of that that sort of element of the legislation has never been activated, um, the code exists and deals are being done and they were done very quickly in with the large publishers. And I guess that sort of I may as well segue into why I'm here, which is because the the large publishers were all successful in sort of reaching agreement with um, both Google and Facebook or one or the other within about six months of the code coming into operation. That was not the case for small publishers who weren't, who, who Google and Facebook, I suspect, I don't know, and if they're listening, maybe they can answer this one day, um, is that they, um, they sort of felt like they ticked the regulatory box by entering enough deals with the significant publishers in Australia without having regard to the importance that we all believe in, which is media diversity, many voices, and Mindaroo's involvement really started because we, particularly from a philanthropic point of view, believed that it was just as important for small publishers and independent publishers to have access to the same rights to negotiate with the platforms as the large publishers had had. Right. So Lauren, so there you are in Sydney publishing your two um, um, publications and you hear, oh, there's this new code, this, this bargaining code, it's going to force platforms to the table. You feel that the platforms, you know, actually owe you a bit of, bit of money for all that content you've been posting on them over the years. Great. Where do I sign? What do you, what happens next? Well, so basically the code set up a regulatory framework for publishers to demonstrate that they were in fact public interest publishers. So we applied to the government. We went through an arduous um, bit of paperwork. Don't do this at home. <laughs> and um, we ha we had to demonstrate that we uh, published um, news content, et cetera, that we had um, uh, regulations around you know, ways that, that readers could complain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we had to provide, there was a financial threshold as one of the, um, one of the um, stipulations. We went through this entire process. I published two titles with two separate companies, so I had the thrill of doing it twice. And um, then we got on, the, we got, we actually one paper didn't get on the, um, on the list because we didn't belong to the Australia Press Council. So I had to cough up a, to me a substantial amount of money to, to join that bureaucracy. APC, sorry, I am a member, but, and, um, and um, then we got on the list. There we were. We sent off our emails to Google and to Facebook and we waited and we waited. And then I said, well, this sucks. And so I, the, the, um, the, the Australian Communications Media Authority, the regulatory body, published a register of all the other uh, public interest publisher, uh, uh, publishers who had been let on, uh, put onto the list. Publishers in Australia don't play well together. We tend to be weary of one another. It's a very competitive place, and you know, there are just a few big cities, and so we don't talk to one another generally. I went down the list calling because there were mobile numbers of the publishers were there. It was really cool. 
And so I started calling, calling. I got, you know, lots of, you know, uh, silence, uh, lots of, oh, I don't know, nothing's going to happen. But then someone said, you should talk to Nelson Yap. Okay. Because he's the only person who actually seems interested in doing anything. So that is how Nelson and I became, as we as we say, comrades. Right. So there's Lawrence. He's he's done all this hard work getting both of his companies onto the register. He thinks that's going to lead to deals with Facebook and Google. It doesn't. I'm assuming you were in a similar position. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And um. So, and so, yeah. When I got the call from Lawrence, he said. What's going on? What have you done? And I said, well, I've sent off letters to Google and Facebook, emails, etc. cetera. Uh, I've contacted the senators who were part of the Senate committee to say what's going on. We've now become a, you know, a registered eligible news business under ACMA, the Australian Communications Media Authority, um, but nothing is happening. And we had senators write letters on our behalf as well to Google and Facebook. And just so you get a picture of the uh, of our group, the Publishers, publishers uh, Interest Publishers Alliance, our Group 24. We represent the arts, sciences, climate media change, uh, climate change, uh, women's rights, women's health, um, and also the multicultural press. So the Greek, Italian, Chinese, Indian, and Jewish newspapers. None of these publishers got a deal. We were ignored. Yet we represented a big cohort of the Australian community, yeah. you know, our audience. But yeah. we weren't getting it. We didn't get a seat at the table. Yeah. So we decided to, uh, yeah, <laughs> you called in the cavalry. Yeah. So Emma, by this point, you so you'd been inside the government when the, all the the, the 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 horse trading was going on that led to the code. The minute the code was was enacted, as I understand it, you got out and went to the Minderoo Foundation. That is true. Yes. Um, I was tired. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, um, I, I, I went to Mindaroo and about six months after I joined, I had a phone call from Rod Sims, who was still the chair of the ACCC at that time. Um, and he asked, he said that he'd had, or his team had been in contact with Nel uh, Lawrence and Nelson and various other small publishers who were having, um, trouble getting uh, Facebook or Google to answer or respond to any of their questions. I mean, in a lot of countries, I think it's the same that um, Google and Facebook are sort of just like post boxes and none of the actual uh, work goes on there except for sort of some ad sales related activity. None of the big policy decisions are made in Australia. There are people who work there, but it, you know it goes up a food chain. So they were just, they were writing to unknown email addresses, I don't know, not getting any response. Anyway, um, so Rod asked me if, I, if we would be interested in supporting them and the ACCC had been very kind to develop a, a very simple collective bargaining process that meant that I could bring together a group of um, publishers and collectively bargain provided they meted a threshold, which was um, revenue of less than 10 million per annum. And it was really straightforward. Um, and I'm very grateful to the ACCC for making it so easy. And so I lodged the form, issued a press release, and off we went. Uh, just to be clear, that process of collective bargaining, that wasn't actually something that the code enabled. That was just a separate piece of competition law, which which allows small companies to come together and buy. Correct. Yes. Yeah. It's not it's not exclusively linked to the code. That is true. Um, and just to clarify the point that um, Lawrence made earlier about the registration process, um, with the benefit of hindsight, I think one of the, the flaws in the communications about the code was that they needed to register to participate in any kind of negotiation when in fact they didn't need to go through that process. Okay. Um, however, I think it's a good process and I think it actually serves as an important listing of credible news media organisations in Australia. So it has a sort of secondary benefit um, and, you know, particularly in the age of disinformation, I think it, yeah. it, it could be a, a stronger sort of tool. Um, you don't agree. Yeah, yeah. I know. Well, <laughs> hey. um, I, think, I think also, I guess we'll, we might, in a moment, I'll throw this open to questions and people might have views upon this because in different countries, seeking government 
authority to be added to a register of eligible publishers. In some countries, that might be fine. In some countries, that yeah. might be quite problematic yeah. and troubling. So let's talk a bit about how that plays out. That is that is true. So um, in November last year, no, not the year before, I can't even remember now, yeah. 2021. COVID, COVID time. <laughs> we, we, started, we started our negotiation. Um, Google were fantastic. Um, they immediately engaged with us and they were very interested in, in working with the publishers. Um, and Facebook directed me direct to their grant program and just said, you can, you, your publishers can apply for a grant through this process. The day they sent me the email saying that the the applications closed literally the next day, and they weren't running another program for another twelve months. Um, so which so they they basically sort of kicked us into the long grass. Whereas Google, I and I've said this many times, they engaged meaningfully, respectfully, and it did take time to get where we wanted to get from where we started to where we ended up, but. The whole journey with Google was, was I think, very sat satisfactory. And do you think, is that because of just different personalities in the two companies or does it reflect different business models and different relationships with news? I, uh, I mean, Lawrence, what do you think? You're nodding. <laughs> well, I, all I can tell you is as a publisher right now in real time, Facebook's algorithms are, are disadvantaging my news posts and are providing all sorts of fabulous coverage to my frivolous, um, thank you, Facebook, um, <laughs> social media posts, right? So if I have a celebrity post, uh, we will get thousands of likes. If I put up an important story of public interest, it will get two likes. We don't pay money to um, Facebook to promote. We rely entirely on the, on the judgment of the algorithms. And it's very clear that there is a, a plan afoot to disadvantage news as probably as part of this Machiavellian plan to to um, distance um, meta from journalism and uh, and I've got to say the whole move of Zuckerberg to the Twitter sphere um, that scares me because I do not trust how the company is managing public interest journalism. Full stop. Nelson, do you agree? Absolutely. Um, so it, just from our experience, it was, yeah, dealing with Google was fantastic um, from the from the start. I mean, obviously there were challenges to get to where we were and then we had to, um, as Lawrence said many times now, herd cats because if I'm sure you're all publishers in this room, if you were getting a call from another publisher, it's like, oh, the last thing you want to do is talk to someone, you've got deadlines and all these things. So. We, after all these processes, yeah, we dealing with Google was great, but I think Facebook, maybe it's a bit of both of what you said, uh, or a bit of everything. Maybe it's just a plan or maybe just Mark Zuckerberg wants to get everything for free. <laughs> right. <laughs> so doesn't want to pay. Right. Mm -hmm. So Google, so you sit down, you have good faith negotiations with Google. And at the end of the day, you walk away happy enough. Mm -hmm. Now I know that we can't talk in detail about what actual money exchanged hands because as is the the case around the world these things are covered up in non-disclosure agreements is there any indication you can give us about you know how happy were you when you left the negotiating table <laughs> on a scale of one to ten yeah i love google that's good <laughs> I love, I mean, yes, I mean, I've You're got to say, and, and I hope they're listening because I, I often say that the, um, they are my best friends. Uh, they have been, they have been incredibly beneficent in terms of, uh, providing us with capital to uh, invest in the digital side of our business. They have been very gracious in helping navigate their, um, bureaucratic nightmare of a company. <laughs> Uh, they have um, provided us with all sorts of, of, of resources that we did not have before and would not have otherwise. So I have nothing but good things to say about Google. And I say that knowing that we are amongst the handful of small independent publishers in, the, in Australia who were lucky enough to get a deal. Thank you, Emma. Okay. So that in itself is really interesting. So now we're coming to the heart of the issue, some of these myths and realities that we want to get clear. So one myth is that only Rupert Murdoch 
benefited from the Australian code, we can very confidently say that is not true. Mm. At least 24 small publishers, and I know many others, yeah. and did, it is also did benefit. The Australian press, uh, sorry, yeah. the Country Press Association right. as well in Australia. Um, not all, but many of their members got deals as well. So in terms of the quantum of how much we got, the ACCC sort of collated the data and it's between 200, 250 to 20. $220 million per year. Across the entire Australian news yes. publishing industry. So yes. it might be right to assume that the Murdoch Empire got a good chunk <laughs> yeah. of that. But yeah. you're in there. Yes, exactly. You're in there. But but as Lawrence says, some smaller independent publishers are not. So it's not. So another thing to get on the table, it's not 100% no, no, coverage. No. And it's mm -hmm. kind of, it's partly luck. It's You, you, you connected with Emma, you got through... Mm. Was it's not, not, no, it was a lot of work. It's yeah. work. It was okay. work, and and also to be you know to be um, you know blunt about it, there were we we are small publishers, yeah, and some of the medium sized publishers um, thought that they were well more important than us, and they they didn't see the value of combining forces with um, with lowly folk like Nelson and me, and and um, they didn't understand that in fact the value of our collective bargaining group was that we represented such a diverse range of voices that our cocktail together was what was what was inviting right right and so and they thought that because they were you know pushing the 10 million dollar level of the of the um of the um, the limit yeah. that, that they had more clout on their own and they didn't need it and honestly the the reality is that 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 um in all of our of our countries, there are some very big media corporations who control the lion's share of information flow, right? And who have been certainly more adversely affected financially by the by the slush of funds that have gone from you know from old media to new to, to new tech. But but small media is very easily overlooked, yeah. right? Yeah. Across the board, and and in Australia, we have the misfortune of being the most consolidated monopolistic media market in the world uh, because we are a small place with basically a, a lot of the population living in five capital cities and so that meant that that it was very easy for the big com tech companies google and facebook to go and do deals with a handful of of companies and effectively tick off 85 percent of the of the media yeah so if we're gonna if we're gonna start drawing lessons from the australian experience it sounds like one is this this thing of herding cats, and I hope that's coming through in the translation, it's an English expression, but you know, essentially or organizing very disorganized people um, and, and eccentric and maverick and autonomous people, herding cats is absolutely essential. Without a cat herder like Emma, you just have a lot of cats running in different directions, scratching each other and chasing wool and tearing down curtains. So that's that's a lesson. We need that. And actually, where the hell do we find that capacity in our countries for small independent publishers to get together and become more than the sum of their parts? It sounds like that's crucial. It is. And I, I think um, one lesson that can be learned from our experience is um, have your collective body and have your membership worked out in advance of um, maybe any legislation coming into force. Um, these guys didn't really have a seat at the negotiating table in the development of the code. They, I mean, there were other, there were sort of independent publishers talking to, to government um, and to um, opposition and crossbenchers about things they wanted included in the code. But uh, uh, if they'd had the Public Interest Publishers Alliance established if while the legislation was being developed, that would have been hugely beneficial to them. So a yeah. lesson is to try and get that organization in advance. Yeah. But, I, but I'd make the point of it. I'm, I'm after this, I'm going to another conference because I'm like all of you suckers. And, um, and uh, th this conference is a group of, of, of independent alternative uh, publishers based in the States. And the, um, the organization is, uh, is opposed to the the bar uh, taking on a bargaining bill like this because they don't want to enrage their primary benefactor google right 
And um, you know, and so this is this is the, the the thing. Small publishers, a we don't have the capacity and the time to to go and and attend a lot of meetings because we're busy doing the dishes. A and then B on top of that, those those of of us who have been fortunate to get breadcrumbs, right, don't want to lose the little morsels that we have. And so some of these um, these grant programs that that the big tech tech companies have that are directed to small independent publishers, you know, have that kind of intoxicating effect. And yeah. so these are the these are the, yeah. the real barriers yeah. that that you have to understand if you want to engage us. Yeah, it's a complicated game of risk, really. Yeah. And that's it's right, isn't it, that if you if the Australian code, if if Facebook or Google were designated mm. under the code and all of its um, requirements came into force, there's a what you call a poison pill in the contracts? Uh, that is what people say. Okay. That there are um, clauses in the agreements that exist with some of the publishers that in the event that there is designation of either of them under the under the code, that the, the deals they've currently got will be terminated immediately. Okay. Um, so there's all so sorts. So basically bought their silence. Right. Yeah. Also through very right. tight non-disclosure agreements. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 And just finally, what would it take for any of the platforms to be designated? How have they avoided designation so far? Oh. Political will. Right. That's my, I mean, it's, it, 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 it is a political decision. It's, it is up to the government of the day to decide whether or not they're going to make it happen. And I, uh, and uh, as, as Emma has pointed out, and I'll let her speak to this, uh, we understand that some of these um, contracts, particularly with Facebook, are about to uh, to to expire because they were just three year deals. And um, once once those expire, if Facebook, who doesn't seem really in the mood to be supporting news, um, doesn't um, come back to the table, there will be some real political pressure from from some very big media players um, in Canberra saying, you know, you've got to um, do something about this. Okay, so we watch this space very carefully. Let me open it up to questions. We've got a room full of world experts. I can see a couple of hands going up. Is there someone with a microphone or how do we how do we do this? Here's the microphone, it's coming. I'll take a little group of three because there's the three hands I could see over there and then we'll we'll come back. If we go to, oh, there we are. That's the first, yeah, thank you. If you announce yourself. Yeah. Uh, yes, hello, I'm Justine Limpet Law and I'm a media lawyer. Um, the critical lesson for me that came out of this group is political will. And that's what I'm particularly worried about when we are trying to deal with um, regulating big tech on this continent. Because we have very few governments on the continent that are um, at all in favor of a robust free, powerful press holding public power accountable. I just keep feeling like this is a wall, a brick wall. And I'm just wondering from your experience in Australia, how do you suppose we get, a, get to grips? How do we confront this problem? Because ultimately, it seems to me that the reason why the Australian example has worked so well is that government has been prepared to back it up. And it looks like that might be the case with Canada too. We're waiting to see what happens when a government is only too pleased to have an increasingly weak, badly funded press. How do we deal with that? That's a fantastic question, Justine. Thank you. I think there was another question before I come to the front. I think there was one there. Yes. Gentlemen, just back, 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 back. That. Oh, does that work? Thank you so much uh, for the insightful uh, panel. Uh, I have Could you questions. introduce yourself? Sorry, my name is Wahyu Diatmika. I am uh, from Tempo, also representing the Indonesia Cyber Media Association. Uh, we are currently uh, also negotiating the same uh, law in Indonesia. We'll talk more about it tomorrow in the Asia part of the of the panel. Um, just two questions, uh, Nelson, Emma, and Lauren. Um, if we use the designation clause, which already happened in Australia, 
Does that mean all the other principles that we fight, that we want to happen in Australia, doesn't happen at all? Doesn't that make the that negotiation only a business uh, compensation kind of thing and not addressing all the other pressing issues, the use of data, the algorithm accountability? How do we also press for those issues? Thank you very much. And then there was a question near the front from Alison. Um, uh, hi, I'm Alison Gilwald from Research ICT Africa and the University of Cape Town. Um, I, I was really wanting to go back to your um, question about the um, kind of commercial confidentiality of these deals. And really the question is, isn't this at the, the, the flaw in the outcomes that we're seeing in the tentativeness and all of that? If these are, you know, public interest interventions, um, why this kind of default into, you know, the... Uh, commercial agreements? Why are we not just accepting that we want a, a regulated outcome and that there would be transparency about that? Because it seems part of the negotiation is actually around, um, you know, that kind of divide and rule that if you reach agreement with one party, you don't want to know that let other parties know what that outcome is. So that you, so it seems to me that, you know, greater transparency on that. And even, you know, some sort of um, a regulation around percentages or who gets what, you know, then you could, it would all be transparent, you would know, and you wouldn't have to rely on imagining what of that 220 million or whatever the competition authority said it was, you know, who went to who. Thanks. So it would seem to be the outcomes. Then. Yeah, no, thank you. Like, there's lots of questions have been coming up, but let's pause now. We've got three big questions, I think. Come back to the panel. I mean, you may not have definitive answers to these. These are some of the questions we're all going to be debating over the next two days, but is there any way that you can see to build political will in those countries which are not enthusiastic about having a free media? Mm. What about all the other non-revenue terms which are so important, data, notice about changes to the algorithm, and why are these deals confidential if we're actually interested in promoting the public interest? Any thoughts, any of you? Lawrence? Well, I'm gonna. I'm like. I'm not going to eat this elephant one bite at a time. I mean, we can't answer all of that. But I'm going to go back to the question of political will, because and, and I'm going to reiterate the point that I made, which is that that the the political will was found when big media players exercised their influence at, at the bargaining table. I really don't think that Nelson and I could have gotten the treasurer of the of the Commonwealth of Australia. To um, to to enact laws like this. So, I guess the question is: if you don't have a powerful um, media um, or you know, p powerful media barons, if you're if you have a completely eviscerated media landscape, you know how does it happen? And I, I I'd have to say, I don't see it happening. And that you know, in, because without without a free independent press to fund, it can't happen. And and you know, and that 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 issue of um, giving of basically using money to reward your um, your political ad your your political allies and punishing those that you don't like and really doing deals with Google is just another version of that that's something that we publishers deal with all the time right I run a, uh, I run a, a, a story attacking a mayor in a in a local city uh, in, in inner Sydney and mysteriously a year's worth of advertising disappears. Those are the political realities of democracy in the free world, and it's it's not a pleasant place to trade in. Nah. Emma, any thoughts on these huge questions? I I think the next two days will hopefully flesh out some answers to the quest the first question. I couldn't not being from this continent, I I think it would be unfair for me to to make a make that comment. But I'd agree with Lawrence that it does make it more difficult. Um, if your government wants the press to be a failure. In, ter in terms of the question regarding the other pieces of the legislation, like the algorithmic changes, etc., I think they are nice to have, and I think you'd all like access to that. But I, I don't know if we're going to get there with designation. So I guess the publishers live with what they can get but, but uh, without, without a doubt those those, those things the other aspects of the code are important right um and the third question it was about confidentiality, confidentiality public interest yeah, yeah. I, 
I, a lot of people raise that issue. Um, obviously, it is what it is. We have their comp they are, the deals are confidential. The legislation didn't provide for that transparency. Um, I've said it before at other conferences that you guys don't disclose how much advertising revenue you get from a particular, you know, advertiser. Um, that's that's a confidential commercial arrangement. And, and these are confidential commercial arrangements because of the way the code is set up. Okay, Emma, at one point you, you made the, the argument to me that because of free trade agreements that, um, that you couldn't actually enter into regulation against these big tech companies and that the spirit of, have, of, of, of inviting bargaining is a way around that. Is that, is that right? Am I simplifying it? <laughs> Uh, the, the free the U.S. free trade agreement played a role, but I I can't remember specifically saying that. But I may well have. No, okay, maybe it was too much red wine that I misheard. <laughs> Nelson, uh, yeah, um, there's, there's, there's questions in terms of political will. I do acknowledge that in Australia, if it wasn't for Kerry Stokes, Rupert Murdoch, and Channel Nine uh, starting this, uh, we wouldn't be here today. Absolutely, having the media empires kickstart this, um, you know, brought, brought forward the code because after what, decades of um, seeing the digital disrupt disruption to our businesses. Um, but for political will, I suppose, lucky for us in Australia, you know, we have an open democracy. Um, but at the same time, it's one of those things, if, yeah, I, 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 it's, hard to, it's hard to explain, but for us, it was... The individual publishers getting together, we're, we're, just, we're, we're, so, we're so small when it's one of us, we, you know, you approach the treasurer, God, we'll never get a meeting, you know, good luck to that. But if we're able to gather 24, 50, 100, and then form some sort of a voice, uh, some sort of alliance, it, it's actually Lawrence made this once, we used to joke that we were the Dairy Queens, because if the farmers wanted the dairy farmers wanted to get a better deal from the supermarkets or better deal from trade or something what did they do they form a dairy uh, collective right to negotiate so therefore we came up with it that we decided that we would be the dairy collective of, of publishing um and that brought together a number of publishers that then we were able to go out and i guess lobby on, on those efforts to the second question um yeah, it would be great, but I don't see it happening um, about getting access to the algorithms. And I see around the world there's a lot of um, uh, pushbacks, the detractors of the Australian code saying it's not perfect. We want the code to be perfect, otherwise we don't introduce it at all because we can't get access to the algorithm. But my point of, uh, to everyone today is that we have to see the code as just the start. It's the first piece of reform. It's not the end. We, you, and who, you, who knows, actually you cannot get perfect because who knows what's around the corner. We have AI around the corner, you know, now scraping our, our data and our stories to train the machine. So all these things, so you can't arrive at perfect ever, but if you can get good, that's a good start. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I also wonder if there is something, because you're talking about strength in numbers within a country. I wonder also something we could talk about at this conference is strength in numbers when publishers from more than one country come together and work through international bodies and perhaps even we could talk about is there a, is there a model for in countries like that where you, you it's just not viable to work with a government publishers coming together globally and working directly with the platforms and striking deals because they have a different kind of political leverage in that way so let's explore some of these themes more as we go on i'm going to take another group of questions there's a gentleman at the back yeah thank you there's lots of questions. I'll try and take them all and then we'll have a final wrap up. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tijan C. I come from Senegal. Uh, a very short question. During the discussions, I heard more pe people talking more about Facebook and Google. Uh, we know now one emerging platform is TikTok. Uh, any, are they any part of uh, the conversations or the deals? Uh, that was the question. Thank you very much. That's a great question. There's, let's just keep working to how, and there's a lady. Oh, sorry, where, 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 where? Oh, here. Okay. Yep. 
Where? Sorry, I forgot no. everyone. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Hi, I'm Diego Garassi from Argentina. Uh, I represent the media association of uh, media companies in Argentina. And I think that we, the next question, we will not breach the confidential uh, agreement that you have. And I wonder if in the process of negotiation uh, between media and Google, if did Google offer open and complete information about its profits in Australia to have that information as basis of the negotiations? Thank you very much. Back over here, yes. Lady. Hi, my name is Wendy Trott from Alt Advisory here in South Africa. My question is, if designation were to happen, what would that mean for the small publishers and the collective bargaining mechanism that you've got set up? And in retrospect, would it have been preferable that that collective bargaining mechanism was included in the bargaining code? Or is it, does it not make much of a difference that it was kind of a separate mechanism? Okay. And then there was another one nearby. Are you writing these down, Jonathan? Jonathan? Yeah. Oh, good. You're right. Hi, I'm Maya. I'm from the Digital Journalism Association in Brazil. Uh, this debate interests me a lot. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, in terms of proportion, you were talking about the number of organizations that were able to collectively bargain. And I just wanted to know how, how what, what was the percentage of organizations that you feel that were able to be part of this type of bargaining? And uh, because uh, we have the worry that in Brazil that many of the organizations that are not necessarily organized in associations such as ours will not be able uh, to be part of this process. So I just wanted to know the proportions. Great. Thank you. More. Oh, there's so many. This is great. <laughs> You've got the mic, you decide. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Chami, I'm from Malaysia. Just now you mentioned that the quantum bid by Google and Facebook to Australian media is about 200 and 250, 20 million Aussie dollar a year. Actually, how do you, what is the basis of that quantum? How do you calculate that? How do you come up with the figures? I mean, the basis of the, of the, negotiation between uh, the media organization and the big tech. Why is that? Why actually uh, the cost of journalism or the cost of operation of the media organization? Okay, thank you. We are really running out of time. Does anyone have like one really quick final? Okay, right here. Sorry. It's quick. Is the Australian broadcasting, the public broadcaster included? Yes. Okay, that was dealt with very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, sorry, one, one more, more, one more. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. Okay, uh, how much? We'll come to uh, My name is Asmito from the Alliance of Independent Journalists, AG Indonesia. I uh, just uh, one question. Uh, how to make sure uh, the result of sharing profit from a digital platform uh, really spend on uh, for quality journalism and welfare journalists? Thank you. Okay, we've got a lot going on here. We've got one and a half minutes. Uh, just really quickly, on TikTok, does the code potentially, could TikTok be designated? It, it, it could. At, at, that would be at the discretion of the treasurer, yes. Right, but it meets the, potentially it meets the criteria. So any emerging platform could come along and be accommodated. But, but 40% of all global advertising is dominated by Facebook and Google. And right. I, I don't think that, I mean, and then when you add in Amazon, you know, you're talking about a, a majority and, um, when TikTok becomes that big, I'll be, I'll be right out the front door. Okay. It would take a legislative amendment though, to include TikTok. Oh, okay. I think, I think I'm just, I'd have to, I'd take that on notice and check. Okay. Interesting. Now, a lot of the questions I think were really about the quantum of money involved. Did Google share? data about its profits, how much did individual publishers get? Probably answer that those pretty quickly. The quant the two twenty million dollar figure comes from Rod Sims, so from his time at the ACCC, and people were telling him, I suspect, what they were getting from the platforms. Um so that that's a number that, that Rod has determined. So we're all 
working off that. In terms of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, yes, they, they received money from both Google and Facebook. Interestingly, SBS, which is our other public broadcaster, that, multicultural. that multicultural broadcaster that's 70% funded by government, it only got a deal from Google, not from Facebook, no explanation as to why it did not get it. Um, and I don't believe the ABC has disclosed where it's put its, how much it got, but it did say that it would put all the money into regional journalism. Um, there was another question about money spent on journalists and, and and journalism, and I think the the without disclosing the sort of the nature of the deals that we achieved, not all of not all of the money has been spent on journalism. But what it does is enables journalism, and I think that was the point that the, these guys have made. And I'm sure they can talk to you in the tea break about the investment that they've received from Google that's improved their businesses. That's then meant they can put on more journalists. So the journalism is a positive consequence of the funding. You can't employ journalists if you don't have a media company. Yeah. You can't have a media company if you can't pay basic expenses, if you don't have a website that's functional, if you can't afford to pay a print bill if you're an old-fashioned printer. So you have to have a holistic view uh, unless you want to you know, go down the model that you literally just give money to writers and um, have them create content in a void. And that, you know, quite frankly, is not how public interest uh, publishing and journalism works. Have we missed any other? I think there may be one or two more, but I'm very conscious we're slightly over time. There's a hell of a lot to get through today. I don't want to take time away from other speakers. We can talk over the tea break. I'm sure Emma, Nelson and Lawrence would be more than happy to answer questions, maybe even off the record. We'll see. No, but, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Join me in thanking such a great panel to start us off.